to praise the Lord as a beginning of our uh, sermon and service at this morning with hymn number 189. 189, shall we open the hymn books and praise the Lord with us. key text reading it's found in Daniel chapter 2 it is changed then here in it is verse 28 we'll read the first part of it and it says there but there is a God in heaven that revealed secrets and make it known to the king Nabucodonosor what shall be in the latter days having this in mind we'll come before the Lord on our knees for opening prayer. Father in heaven, we come before thy throne of grace at this moment of the morning to praise thy name for thy loving care, for thy grace, for thy beauty, for the way we treated us during our entire life. We thank you so much for this renewed opportunity to be here united, to learn from thy word, to bring our gratitude, and to receive from thee more grace. We thank you for uh, young people, for visitors, for uh, our brothers and sisters, 
for the way we you you have been with us and we want to be united here we want to uh, bring glory not only in this place but every day bringing fruits for the salvation of the man and for thy glory we may uh, receive uh, care from thy hand and may we uh, direct it to others we may receive blessing from you may we do the same thing to others help us to learn from thee and treat others in the way that you treat us may thy uh, holy spirit be with us in such a way that uh, we grow we learn and we uh, take decisions that will stand for now and for eternity bless the speaker bless the congregation bless thy people all around the world and help us to prepare and unite ourselves for the soon coming of jesus in his precious name and through the holy spirit we ask for all these things amen, amen. It's good to be with you this morning, and I want to welcome everyone who had the desire and the power and the strength to be with us. Uh, I want to welcome those which are uh, following us and listening through the media. And uh, even they are not present here, they are present with us uh, with their soul, with their desire in here. Uh, we want to thank the Lord, as we say in our prayer, for his rich and beautiful care that he offer us. I was just thinking in the time we were singing that uh, the world celebrates, because that's the world that we are in. We celebrate the good and the bad things that happen to us. You know what celebrates today? Ten years from a bad thing that happened, right? Tsunami. Yeah, tsunami. We were protected by the Lord, right? And I, just fresh memories came in my mind. Uh, see, um, we do have this privilege today, here in 2014, the last Sabbath of the year, as Brother Maurice mentioned at the Sabbath School, uh, to be still here, to be united. It is in one hand a privilege, the other one it's a sad thing, because we are still here, Jesus did not come yet. But we have still his promises and his, uh, uh, his uh, support. And that's why we came here, we united together here to uh, share our experiences and our uh, uh, gratitude for what he did and what he do, does do for us and continues to do for us. Now, um, we'll have, um, as usual um, today, the... Um, uh, Sabbath uh, service, and uh, nothing has changed uh, today in our uh, program except uh, the key text and the title that, uh, that is uh, a little bit different than what you see there in the programs. We'll have the lunch and we'll invite the people for, uh, for, uh, uh, for the lunch. We invite everybody as welcome to stay with us here. And we'll have uh, uh, even next Sabbath the same thing. So it's, it's a smooth transition without big changes between the years. So uh, if you'll enjoy today, I hope to see everyone next Sabbath here too, as well. Um, and now we invite the ushers to uh, come and collect the um, uh, offerings. And uh, whosoever wants to bring the tithes and offerings to the Lord here is well, very welcome.
Thank you for our offerings. May them be blessed for bringing souls to salvation to Christ. Amen. Um, it is a special moment, the last opportunity for our children, for our young people to present a special uh, program. I think it's not just a song or just a song, a special program, and we'll just sit down and enjoy what they have for us. Praise be the Lord. 
before we give uh, Brother Walter the opportunity to present the message for this morning, uh, we have one more announcement, that is um, Brothers Doreen Burka desire for next Sabbath to have a meeting with the young people, uh, the special meeting with the uh, teenagers, young people, at 2 o'clock here in Toronto, to, uh, next Sabbath afternoon, so a week from now, at 2 o'clock, for those which used to participate to be here because Brother Dorin does have a presentation with the young people. As you probably notice, uh, the key text was change as well as uh, the title. And the title, as was introduced by the last song, is The Lessons from the Book of Daniel. And uh, we are thankful to the Lord that even the voice of our speaker, Brother Walter, has changed. He recovered very well after the last week uh, difficulty uh, uh, to, to present. Uh, because voice is important. It's an important tool. And uh, we are thankful to the Lord that he is giving us voice. And like I said in the Sabbath school, the main tool to bring the gospel is the human voice. So this message will be brought to human voice. Let's have ears to hear the message of the Lord that comes through human voice. And we invite Brother Walter to present that subject. pleased to see so many dear brethren here this morning. I'm very happy to see visitors with us and I trust and pray that God will grant you a wonderful time together with us that uh, the Holy Spirit, the Jesus himself through his personal representative Holy Spirit will be with us this morning and help us to benefit spiritually from this meeting. Brethren, um, as Brother Claudio mentioned, some changes. First of all, Brother Dorin was scheduled to speak today, but there is a communion service in Puslin Church, so he asked me if he could be substituted. And I said, okay, we'll do it. So he, next Sabbath, Sabbath, I'm scheduled here, but he will be here in Toronto. Second thing, I have changed the topic. And I hope you will not mind. I still intend to speak on the topic saved by grace, judged by works. But uh, I will present it, God willing, whenever next time I will be speaking here. The reason why I decided to, 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 to change the topic is twofold. Uh, one is, uh, in our Sabbath school lessons, we are just finishing about witnessing, how we are witnessing in the world. And uh, the example of Daniel, a book of Daniel, is a fantastic, is phenomenal piece of literature, biblical literature, which gives us example about witnessing in the high place. The second thing is that uh, uh, somehow we have young people and children, a lot of them in our churches. They're having break now. They will be going back to the schools, uh, colleges, wherever they go, universities. And we want them to know what is their identity, what are the values they stand for. And the book of Daniel is an excellent source to learn about this and for all of us. So I believe that we all will be benefiting. I know that you have studied, you have um, read the book of Daniel many times. I will not be going so much into the prophecies, analyzing them, but I would like to see a rather the witness of prophet Daniel today, analyze it together with you and his friends. I know there are some, uh, many people who are joining us through media, through internet. We welcome them as well. And we welcome those who especially are not so frequently with us uh, in the, this church. I will not mention people by names, but I want you to, to let you know that we really appreciate your presence with us, and we pray that God may bless you and your families. This is, as Brother mentioned, the last Sabbath in this year. We are entering into a new year. And I believe that the book of Daniel can give us also assurance that there is a true God who controls the future, 
who controls the past, who is transcendent God above everything and all else, and who loves us and who cares about us. And I believe that we will all be strengthened, encouraged, and built up in this study today. Now, <clears throat> when we talk about Daniel, Prophet Daniel, <clears throat> Prophet Daniel was really an outstanding man. He was a remarkable man. Now, it is a, really an accomplishment to come to the top of the government, one government, to become highest executive officer. But Daniel managed to be at the top two governments, two empires, world empires. You cannot find such a man easily in the world history. He's an outstanding man, even by the worldly standards. So Daniel, young people, children, is example par excellence. You cannot really find such a man. Joseph was a similar example. You know, I like from my childhood these Bible biographies. And in the book of education, we are told that young people and children should study these great characters of the Bible because they can inspire us. But with Joseph, when you study, and I will cover Joseph some other time, we will be actually studying in our new quarterly about Joseph. Now, Joseph was also a very interesting character. But in that story about Joseph, we are dealing more, more with the family issues. We are having a dysfunctional family. We are having problems. And then there is one man who providentially rises to the top. And he ultimately brings reconciliation in the family. And God accomplishes his purposes through this remarkable man, Joseph. Now, in the story of Daniel... We are having preeminently a remarkable man, man of God, who is at the top of the government, like Joseph, but we are more dealing with his public witness. We will see the book of Daniel, first six chapters, is actually revolving around Daniel and his companions, and they are directly involved, witnessing for God in that particular you know, empire. Now, I believe that Daniel lived and his friends about 26 centuries ago. And I'd like to read, that you open with me the book of Daniel, chapter 1, and that we read a few verses. <coughs> Excuse me. I will be speaking with a little bit lower voice, but I trust that you can hear me. From chapter 1, verse 1 and onward. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, the Hebrews say Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God, which is he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. Let me just stop for a moment and share with you a few thoughts. The third year of reign of Jehoiakim. We know from historical records that this was about year 606, 605 BC. Now, there was a little bit dis, uh, uh, among historians discussion, is it the third year of Jehoiakim when Nebuchadnezzar came? Now, what is very interesting, Nebuchadnezzar was a son of of Nabopolassar, his father who ruled Babylon. And his father sent him on a military campaign to Palestine. So as Nebuchadnezzar was in Palestine, waging war, even conquering, you know, Judah, the message came in the summer of 605 that his father died. So you see how it was in old days and as it is in, you know, modern days, if you want to secure the throne, you have to be quick when the emperor dies, right? To be in the right place at the right time. To claim, you know, the title. So this is what Nebuchadnezzar did. So he came back to Babylon and he was, you know... So actually, histor historical records confirm that it was 605, third year of Jehoiakim. Then when he came to Jerusalem and besieged it, and the Lord gave Jehoiakim 
king of Judah into his hand with part of the vessels and so on. Now you see, when historian, historians come to such a text, they would a little bit, you know, be puzzled and say, well, this is a little bit private or subjective. The Lord gave the king Jehoiakim into the hand of King Nebuchadnezzar. You see, historians would say, well, what is this? Now, every history, let me tell you, every history is subjective. Because historians are subjective. When they choose material or sources they will be using and reporting about, and they are also subjective when they give interpretation of history. Every history is subjective. But anyway, but Daniel believed, and we will find it out later on, Daniel believed that when he wrote the book of Dan uh, this book, that it was not by chance that King Jehoiakim was conquered by King Nebuchadnezzar. Do you know something about that? Did the, did the prophets did the prophets prophesy that something like this will happen? Prophet Jeremiah, he was saying, "Do not follow idolatrous practices, because I will send an idolatrous nation, the nation whose language you do not know. They will come and take over your kingdom. You will lose your kingdom and your sovereignty, your land that I promised to you." They disobeyed. Repeatedly and ultimately what happened? Forty nation, idolatrous nation comes and takes over. What is very interesting, you will later on find in the book of Daniel chapter 9 that Daniel was studying the prophecy of Jeremiah and he understood that the 70 years that Jeremiah prophesied are coming to the fulfillment. So Daniel was praying, God, please, Look, may your face shine upon thy sanctuary and so on. So see, this is amazing. These are details that you find in the book of Daniel. Right away, you see, you know, from which uh, angle he is coming here to this book. And now, <clears throat> we go on. Uh, I will deal with other issues in a moment. And now, verse 3 and on. And the king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of the, his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish, but well favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning in knowledge and understanding science and such at, as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years, that at the end of thereof they might stand before the king. Now among these were of the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names. For he gave unto Daniel the name Belteshazzar, and Hananiah Shadrach, and Mishael Meshach, and Azariah Abednego. Now, Think about this. It was well known in the ancient times that emperors, when they would conquer a nation, they would take from that nation the most, the brightest and the best young men and also some women to the empire, to the seat, you know, the capital city, and then they would put them in their schools to train them, actually to retrain them and to give them new identity. And you know what? This did, did pharaohs, the kings of, of Egypt did it, and also Babylonian king did it. What they did, sometimes when they conquered the nation, they left the old king in power as, you know, paying the tribute and being vassal. But when the old king father died, they would put in his place his son, who was trained in the emperor, emperor empire schools, who, was, who knew the language, who knew the culture, and who knew the policies of the empire. So this was King Nebuchadnezzar doing. He brought these brightest and best and gave them opportunity to excel in all, in all sciences and, and, and arts, everything what Babylon could offer. Now, could you imagine these men, we are told they were coming from a higher uh, level of society, princes, and, and royal seed. 
But still, Judah was a small nation. Jerusalem was a small city. Now they are coming to the world empire, to the capital of the world. And could you imagine these young men, what they were seeing there? Just think about that. Just imagine. Now, they lived in Babylon, the mighty city and state, one of the wonders of the world. There have been spectacular architectural sites. You heard about the gate of Ishtar. Some remnants even today are preserved and you can see them in the museum in Berlin, in Germany. You can see, you know, these gates of Ishtar. I don't know, we don't have uh, um, images. I didn't have time to put in PowerPoint everything together. But these are amazing images. You see, art architectural sites, ziggurats. Ziggurats were skyscrapers of the, of the ancient world about even 100 meters tall, 300 feet, feet tall. It's a kind of terrace-like, uh, pyramid-like structure for their gods. Amazing sights. Now let me tell you something else. What we inherited from Babylonians, measuring of time, dividing in time in an hour in 60 minutes and a minute in 60 seconds, this comes from Babylon. Mathematics. You know, Greeks are often credited and Greek mathematicians, but they were borrowing from Babylon. Great astronomers. In cuneiform tablets, you are still having computation of the paths of celestial bodies, astronomical you know, calculations. They were able to calculate, predict accurately the solar and lunar eclipses at that time. This was Babylon. Feats of engineering especially water engineering, you know, how they were putting the gates, you know, you know the water, Euphr Euphrates was running through the city of Babylon, through the gates. It was an amazing city, an amazing culture, language, arts, and so on. Music, libraries all over the place. There is a book by, written by George Rowe, uh, a French uh, a historian who wrote the book Ancient Iraq. I recommend the book to you to read it. And you know what he says in that book? No nation in the world has been so permeated with ideas of gods as was Babylon. 1197 temples in the city of Babylon. Gods were associated with everything, with every institution of learning or art or performing art. There was, you know, they associated it with their gods. And uh, <clears throat> so what this was a challenge very advanced culture, very advanced technology. Now, a young man from Jerusalem comes there, and he's looking that there is a king's, there is a university, in, 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 imperial university, and there is a king's college. And, you know, they were, they were thinking, how come that we didn't have in Jerusalem such schools, such technology? This was a challenge to them, in a, in a way, you know. And, and what was else? A challenge <clears throat> surrounded with all this learning and technolo technological advances they might have asked them why didn't we have all these trails of the College of Babylon back in Jerusalem how can all this be developed and achieved in polytheism polytheistic you know system and the main god was called Marduk also Bel B-E-L this was the chief god you see, we should learn something about ancient Babylon when we read about modern Babylon. There are very valuable lessons you can learn here. And I'll tell you how we can connect. Historians have discovered an ancient epic, Enuma Elish. This was something similar to the, some historians try to compare it to the book of Genesis about the origin of the world, how the world came into existence, and even how gods came into, into existence. So you see, in that particular piece of literature, which is discovered in cuneiform in the 19th century, you are having a very interesting story, but which is not exactly the same as the story in the book of Genesis. What are they saying? And please take note of this, which is very similar to the modern humanist, secularist, atheistic, view of the world. Although they had gods, but look how they 
view the gods. They believed in so-called urnamu, or primeval soup. So the supreme first gods were god of ocean, salt water, and gods of rivers. So from waters, you know, similar to like Genesis, but from the matter and energy, from that soup, the gods arise. And their gods are fighting with each other. And then, you know, arises, is born the highest god, Marduk. Now, this is very similar to the contemporary culture and scientific world. You know what they say? You can read Richard Dawkins, a well-known atheist, who will say, yes, I believe there might be intelligences in this universe. Of course. And they're not denying possibility that this is our universe, there are intelligences. But these intelligences came the same way how life evolved here, from the matter and energy. There is no transcendent supernatural being, God, who has no beginning, who is not dependent on matter and energy. This was a Babylonian view of God. Do you understand this? The same view that scientific world has today. They are, you know, bracketing out supernatural God who has no beginning. This is the theology and philosophy of Babylon. They are gods, but gods came from the matter and energy. And see, brethren, this was a challenge for young Hebrews who were in that environment. They had a different concept of God, and you will come to that we, when, we, when we were dealing with, you know, when King Nebuchadnezzar had put a question to his astrologers and scientists, and they could not answer. Then Daniel comes and says, there is a God who knows the future, when they could not answer the question superior deity he they were witnessing for that god our young people today in the modern secular universities there is a tremendous pressure today on us to lose our identity and this is what happened in babylon with these young men pressure to lose your identity who you are what do you stand for so as we move further, <clears throat> in the book of Daniel, it's an amazing book of testimony. You know what? Have you noticed that in the book of Daniel, we are having a part where you have direct testimony from the King Nebuchadnezzar. Do you know that? King Nebuchadnezzar is giving testimony. It's recorded in Aramaic language in the book of Daniel. He experienced God. What, what an amazing story. What an amazing testimony. It's a great witnessing tract. Now, the king was a secular monarch, and Daniel was a man of God. And they stood side by side. Side by side was a secular monarch and Daniel, running the kingdom, running the empire. This is the book of Daniel. Daniel stood faithful. Brethren, at such high place witnessing for God. And we say, oh, we cannot witness for God. And I am, we are so much lower. What kind of excuse we can find? No matter where we are, in the school, in the university, in academia, wherever. I heard one Christian apologist who became a great scientist and mathematician. He was, when I was at the university, University of Oxford. And I was witnessing for God as a young person. Nobel laureate, who was a you know, higher-ranking officer at the university, came to me, invited me to his office and some other you know, professors. And he said, look, you are a talented young man. We can see that. But you know what? If you want to have future in scientific world, in academia, you have to give up this childish notion of God. Understand me? So he said, oh, well, professor, what do you want me to believe to stand for? Do you have an alternative? <laughs> and then he began, you know, some kind of a evolutionary, you know, proposal making to him. He said, look, thank you very much, but I have already something much better. <laughs> so you see, this is the world in which we live. Brethren, we have nothing to be ashamed of wherever we go. 
Don't be children, young people, ashamed of your identity in the present world. We have a superior source, superior source of knowledge, which is our God, the Creator. So, you know what? In the book of Daniel, we also have predictive prophecies. Daniel predicted future events that happen. I don't go into that much today, but that really happen in exactly as he predicted. Now, what is a shame? A great shame to Christian scholars, Bible scholars, that in many high schools of learning, theological schools, people do not believe in the revelation. They do not believe that Daniel really lived in the 6th century BC, that he predicted events that took place later on, but that he lived in the 2nd century BC after the fact and wrote the prophecy as fulfilled history. Could you believe that? Christian scholars, it's a shame. Hard to believe, brethren. And we profess Christian faith. We just now had a Christmas, you know, major holiday. And what is, what is Christmas? Then the prophecy. What is the Old Testament? Then the prophecy about coming of the Messiah. If you don't believe in, then don't call yourself a Christian if you don't believe in prophecies. Right? Because he was prophesied. He was born exactly how the prophet, prophets foretold. So if there is no supernatural power of revelation from that source, so we should throw away the Bible and not claim or profess to be Christians. We should say we are agnostics. We do not believe in the Bible. We are who knows what. See, Bible has true, as, as, the, as the apostle said, we have the most short word of prophecy. And you do well when you watch unto it as a light in a dark place. It's a dark place where we live. Now as we move on, brethren, I'd like to mention one thing here. If you go to chapter 1, verse, uh, chapter, uh, one, verse 2, and you read here in verse 2, And the Lord gave Jeho Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. Now, why is Daniel mentioning these vessels from the house of God? That's a very interesting, you know, proposition. Or mention. Daniel is not so talking much about himself, but he's talking about these vessels. Now, these were consecrated vessels 